welcome to our 135th online gathering for congregational leaders across the country. Wow. This weekly gathering is called Courageous Leadership. It's sponsored by ELCA's Coaching Ministry. I am Jill Beverlin. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the program manager for this ministry and one of your facilitators today. As part of my traditional land acknowledgement, I would like you to know that my home is located on the Fox River in Appleton, Wisconsin. This area is the ancestral territory of five nations of native indigenous peoples, the Menominee tribe, the Ho-Chunk Winnebago tribe, the Potawatomi tribe, the Oneida tribe, and the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohicans and the Brothertown community. I honor and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this territory on which I live. As we step into our time today, friends, I also encourage us to remember that we are seeking to create a safer and braver space in these gatherings for you to bring the truth of who you are and how you are doing. These conversations are meant to be an intentional step to live more fully into God's dream for us as the body of Christ. So again, welcome, friends. I hope you're doing well. Here we are, rounding the corner, looking towards Palm Sunday. How did we get there? It feels like Lent went over like that. But we are glad that you're here today, and we hope that you are encouraged by the conversation that we will have. Today, we are hosting Pastor Jeff Lindman, who has served as an ELCA pastor in Illinois and Florida in his career. He has a special passion for redevelopment work which has uniquely prepared him to lead initiatives related to supporting congregations as we strive to thrive beyond the challenges of COVID. Jeff is also founder and coordinator of a movement called Ignite the Church Conference, which has been held in Orlando for the past six years. As a reflection of his heart for generosity, all proceeds from this event have been donated to the ELCA's Fund for Leaders movement. Jeff, thank you for being with us today and welcome to our space. We look forward to learning with you. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. I'm actually uh, not in the mountains of North Carolina, uh, but that is our dining room view uh, from where we retired. Somebody's got to live there, you know. And uh, I'm going to get ready to uh, share my screen actually in Atlanta, where our grandson is, and I'm shamelessly going to uh, uh, show you one picture of him during the presentation, if you so indulge me. <laughs> All right, so I'd like for us to begin uh, to center in on uh, what I consider to be a pretty obscure uh, word for today. My wife and I found our way to this passage from James about a year ago, I must have skimmed over it many, many other times in my ministry, probably getting hung up with Luther down in uh, the, talking about faith is uh, not really active in love, it's not faith, and Luther wanted to throw it out. This one might not have been a bad one to throw out from some people's perspective, but I think that it is a powerful, powerful uh, um, witness for us in this uh, crazy uh, challenging time that we live in. So I'm going to contextually just share this with you, make some comments, and then uh, we'll take a moment to pray and then get right into it. Here's what James says. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. You hear the Pauline kind of feeling here, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. And then he goes on to say, if any of you are lacking in wisdom, and I think in this day and age when we're trying to figure out what has changed and who changed the game book and all that stuff, how do we get beyond COVID? How do we find ourselves uh, in a more sane environment? How do we get the church to thrive again? How do we deal with all this in-person and virtual stuff, uh, limited resources? If anyone is, is uh, lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously, this is the promise, and ungrudgingly, and it will be given you. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts 
is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the winds, where the doubter, being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Here ends the good news for today. <laughs> when I read that, I'm going, oh my goodness, what a, what a hard word to deal with. But I think that it really, to me, it points to the absolute importance of moving beyond doubt to resurrection faith. Beyond seasons of doubt to resurrection faith. And after all, as Lutherans, we understand we're saved by grace through faith. And faith and grace are gifts of God. So I'd like for us to begin with prayer. And then I'm going to jump into my presentation as we try to move today through these seasons of fear, worry, and doubt. Resurrection faith beyond Lent now in Holy Week. Let's pray. The Lord be with you. Gracious Lord, we ask your blessing now as we come into your presence. May your spirit empower us. May your spirit touch our hearts, our souls at the deepest level. Open our eyes to new opportunities, to, to next steps that will help us not only uh, get through this season, but thrive beyond it. Open our hearts and minds to where you would like to lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to try to, there, I'm trying to get everything off my screen so that I can see my screen fully, and I think I have. So friends, what I'm going to share with you today is the, the fruit of about seven years of work around the area of church renewal, congregational renewal. What I'm sharing today is really a, uh, it's, it's a, I've pivoted multiple times, and this has uh, been uh, adapted and morphed into new things. And, and what I'm lifting up today is called Thriving in and Beyond COVID. Some of you may feel you're already beyond it, others deep still in it, but ultimately living and leading with resurrection faith. My hope is that our time today will be an encouragement for you, an inspiration for you, and a challenge for you. I also recognize that what I'm going to be doing here is kind of like leading you through a season of drinking from a fire hose. Imagine we're, we're talking baptismal power, right? Um, and so I don't want you to be stressed out over the fact that, oh, I've got to write that down because I'm going to make this PowerPoint available um, uh, to Jill and Jason and they can distribute it. Um, and there's also places so you can contact me by email um, or, or uh, through the website and check all that out. I want to start by just taking us back to uh, March of 2020, pre-COVID realities. Uh, 80 to 90 percent of U.S. churches were plateaued or declining. Uh, 3,500 to 4,000 churches were closing every year. That's 10 plus, plus per day in the congregational renewal events, the 40 some I've led. Fear and worry were uh, pervasive in the church, sustainability questions, and of course the toxic fruit of fear and worry is doubt. So what has happened since March of 2020? Has it improved? <laughs> no, um, it's gone viral. Fear, worry, and doubt are at pandemic levels in a lot of places. These are clearly challenging times. When you think about uh, the research that Barna has done early on, they predicted that one in five churches could close as a direct result of COVID. More recent uh, uh, research has indicated where people gone. Some people are back in person, some are online, some have gone to other churches. But one of the most troubling stats that I've seen is that 16 to 20% of active churchgoers have stopped attending any church. They were attending before with regularity and they are no longer attending. That's very troubling. And then probably the most, uh, for those of us who are leaders in the church, 51% of mainline pastors, according to Barna, have thought about quitting during this season. That's very sobering. And it's particularly sobering when you understand that when fear, worry, and doubt become the dominant voices, in a congregation or in our own lives, faith takes a backseat to fear. And the focus 
shifts to our diminishing resources. I've been doing some thinking lately about how what we're going through right now relates to the Great Depression in 1929. Uh, my parent, my father and my mother were, were young children then. My grandparents, great-grandparents, maybe some of your grandparents, great-grandparents endured. And there was a legacy of the Great Depression that manifested itself in a scarcity mindset that continues to dwell in our churches. There's only so many resources to go around, so you got to protect yourself in case there's another Great Depression. It affects our stewardship in many ways, rather than stepping into God's mindset of abundance. And I've been realizing that maybe we could call what happened in 2020, in 2020 the Great Disruption, okay? The Great Disruption. And um, we don't know what, what the long-term effects of that disruption is going to be in the life of the church. My fear is that if we don't do this well, the great disruption could affect generations to come in the life of our nation, life of our world, and the life of our congregations. We want to move beyond it. Certainly, we have faced seismic shifts, right? Where do we go from here? And we, we first of all need to go to our faith. And Luther loves Psalm 46. It speaks to seismic shifts. We will not fear, though the earth should change and the mountains and the mountains shake and tremble in their midst. We've got to find our way uh, through this challenging time. Now, there was a wise person named Albert Einstein that once said in the midst of every crisis, lies great opportunity. And I think uh, Einstein knew what he was talking about. God is with us as we face this po post-COVID church reality. And I embrace foremost Romans 8, 28, that God makes all things work together for good. And that's my hope as we move forward. But my concern is that if we don't address fear, worry, and doubt, those things can become a cancer in the church, deflating the corporate spirit, derailing dreams, and diminishing impact. And we all carry those. It's not that we, we, we avoid fear, worry, and doubt at all costs. It's a natural response to crisis and loss and grief. But we can't let them become the dominant voice, and we've got to find ways to move beyond them. Jesus understood uh, the impact of fear, worry, and doubt. 24 times in the Gospels, Jesus said, don't be afraid, don't worry, do not doubt. Why? Because these things interfere with the power of faith at work that moves mountains and helps us realize not only movement of faith, but, but mission. So I would ask, as you think about today, where are you today in your journey, three plus years beyond the first word about COVID? From fear to faith, from despair to hope, from a mindset of scarcity to a mindset of abundance. My fear is that many of us have moved further to the left than we were in March of 2020. And I would lift up today a 2023 mission challenge for all of us to do the things that we need to do personally and in our congregational settings, ministry context, to help ourselves and one another move from fear to faith, from despair to hope, by focusing not so much on our limitations, but on God's abundance and on the things God wants to bless. When I was given the first privilege to plant a congregation back in 1996 and move from Illinois to Florida, to relaunch uh, Living Word Lutheran Church. The first weekend after receiving the call, I found my way to a confirmation camp in Wisconsin and uh, sat down next to a pastor I didn't know and I asked what he was doing and he said, I'm a church planner. And I said, really? Yeah, he said, I've done it twice. I said, really? I said, you have a word of advice for me. And instantly he said, you're gonna have to trust God more than you've ever trusted God before. And it, true, it proved to be very true. It was an arduous but inspiring, exciting move. But we had to trust God more than we've ever trusted God before. Recently, I ran across a, uh, a quote from Rick Warren 
So we think about, is this a, a possible or an impossible situation to rise and thrive beyond? And Rick said this, never let an impossible situation intimidate you. Let it motivate you to pray more, trust more, expect more. Good words, pray more, trust more, expect more. You might be surprised at the third, but that's the one that jumped out at me from what Rick had to say. I want to make it clear that, that what I'm sharing with you is rooted uh, and shaped by my unique ministry context and the privilege that I had in 1996, moved to the east side of Orlando uh, to restart a congregation that had no building. This building in the upper left was a, a vacant United Methodist building that they had abandoned in a neighborhood that, that had no visibility at all. And the Lutherans said, let's try to restart here. They had 40 to 50 mostly retired people. The area was growing. The ELCA made a new commitment. I was called as a mission developer. We launched on Easter Sunday, uh, six months later in a tent, uh, spent six years in uh, school setting up, tearing down. We were 12 weeks away from building, six plus years later, 12 weeks away from building the facility in the lower right, a family life center, when the developer pulled the rug out from under us. And yeah, this is a blank screen. This is the best I can do for wilderness. Uh, two days after Easter and said, I'm going to build all around that building. It's a long story, too long for now. I was absolutely devastated, exhausted. Uh, fortunately, we were, we were going to, my intern and I were going to a conference in Arizona where I could lick my wounds. And uh, someone there said, well, you gotta stop trying to build a church building, just find four walls and a roof. He directed me to call the church in, in Fort Lauderdale that had bought a Harris computer office warehouse thing. And I called the, and we were gonna be there the next weekend. Thought, well, let's go see what that looks like. And the secretary or receptionist said to me, around here, our pastor in situations like this says, you got to embrace Ephesians 3.20. And I paused and I had to humble myself and I say, I don't know that verse. It changed my life and ministry. By the power at work within us, God is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. This is part of Paul's prayer. It starts in 14. And it's clear that the power is God's spirit working within us as we're rooted and grounded in love. And in the end, it's, it's God's power at work within us. It's God who accomplishes. But look at how this, the superlatives that Paul uses, not just what we ask, but all, more, far, abundantly, and not just what we ask, but what we can imagine. So we started to pray more and trust more and expect more. We gathered around a vacant home improvement warehouse. It was called Builder Square. And we started to sing the doxology for 18 months. Uh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. We simply wanted a place to make a difference in our community. And in the darkest moment, seriously, um, the owner of a bowling alley across the street from the Builder Square called. It was vacant. They'd moved into a Walmart. And they said, some things have changed. Make an offer. We'll consider it. And amazingly, not only did they, uh, were they open to a million dollar cut in what they were asking, but the fund for missions, the mission investment fund uh, invested in this and this bowling alley pizza hut thing became our first mission outpost eight and a half years after starting the journey. And I'll tell you, this was abundantly far more than anything I could have asked or imagined. But this wasn't about the building. This was about God's work among folks who trusted that God was up to something. And amazingly, we also were passionate about our homeless neighbors. We became a catalyst that ultimately led to the county government spending $2 million uh, to invest in a, in, a, in a building and rehab it and give the keys to churches, the churches in East Orlando to operate for $10 a year, serving hundreds and hundreds of homeless folks every year, 2 million to about 100,000 in-kind investment. It was amazing. We also, during this time, 
uh, met someone from Burundi, Africa. We ended up supporting some ministries there, ended up meeting Lutherans who had been refugees for 15 years after the genocide. Uh, in T Tanzania, became Lutheran, came back. They had no pastor. I met these folks while I was there with another mission group. And uh, our translator, this gentleman's in the right side, 15 years later now, okay? We've been supporting him for 13 years. They've planted a church with five churches, 2,000 members, and he was just elected the first presiding bishop of Hope Evangelical Lutheran Church in uh, Burundi, Africa, adjacent to Rwanda, if you wonder where it is. And he's asked me to come and hang out with him when he's installed in August of this year. One of the greatest joys of my ministry, I get emotional even thinking about it. And this is all abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. So out of this, my friends, has, has moved this, this resource that I think is will help you get in the right frame of mind um, to thrive beyond COVID. There's the the, uh, the web address. Everything's free, and I want to I want you to know that the the reason that I created this uh, back in 2021 is I think that the greatest risk we face is neglecting the lingering emotional impact of COVID on the spirit of leaders and congregations. This has been unprecedented. And devastating for so many so many people the grief is palpable the fear worry and doubt is real and so um if we neglect that you see we are in a bad spot we've got to move beyond it we've got to help people cathart and release it so the resource it has three parts let go trust god rise up it uses a biblical resource bible study journaling uh, Lexio Divina kind of stuff, small group exercises, directed conversation to help people release burdens, promote faith, and empower greater kingdom impact. Uh, it's free. All the downloads are editable. There's leader guides, small group participant guides, retreat guides, five videos, um, seven resource worship resources, um, small and large group resources, three or four sessions, workshop, all this stuff. Uh, so that it can exponentially grow beyond just me going out and leading a retreat. And I'm excited to say that it's been downloaded by 750 leaders in 43 states, seven countries, and 14 denominations. So I want to share it with you, <clears throat> not because I want to market it, but I want to get you to, to, if this is something that would be useful to you, to help you get in the right frame of mind to move from crisis to opportunity, to release yourself from the grief, to focus as we journey through Lent to resurrection and thrive, then by all means, check it out. Um, a lot of things have happened that are good. We've learned that Lutherans can change and adapt. And I think we need to embrace this opportunity while the concrete is still wet, really. Congregational uses, I designed it for small group Bible studies, church council study workshops, all congregation weekend event. I still lead events. I was in Birmingham a few weeks ago and Atlanta earlier uh, in January, but that's not my desire. I want this to be self-led self or facilitated by others because then it can, it can happen, you know, more. It can multiply and its impact can grow. It's also got possibilities if your synod is still looking for a resource for training, Zoom training, for deans to work with uh, their, their leaders in their conferences, cluster events, rostered leader gatherings, Zoom webinars, you name it, um, the sky's the limit. My top concern is discouraged and weary leaders with depleted faith. That's my top concern because that, that's why I developed thriving in and beyond COVID, living and leading with resurrection faith. In fact, really thriving in and beyond whatever challenges we face. Um, and that sobering challenge of James, the doubter being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. What if the greatest doubter in the congregation is the pastor or the rostered leader? Um, what if that's where, uh, or the council president or whatever, right? It's a sobering challenge. God wants to move us beyond doubt to faith. I mean, the importance of faith 
is underscored here in James, but Jesus was clear. But Thomas, he didn't scold him for doubting. Just do not doubt, but believe. The Gospel of John wrapped up so that through believing you may have life in Jesus' name. And Luther, of all people, understood the power of faith. He said, justified by grace through faith, through faith. Leaders need to lead. And when leaders are depleted, oh my goodness, leaders can't lead people where they don't believe it, where they don't believe it's possible to go. And congregations won't thrive until their leaders believe it's possible. The essential first step. And if you take nothing more from today, make sure that if you are still holding on to fear, worry, and doubt, and it's still eating away at your spirit, find a way personally to share that with God, with others, and in some way, shape, or form, and, and release its power for, from you. Um, exorcise its power so that it doesn't eat away at, at your spirit. And do the same for the congregation so that it doesn't eat away at your congregation's recovery and future vitality. I can't impress upon you any more than that. It starts with you and with me. And this is the goal of session one. You can just use that session if you wanted to with your leaders. And it really is not unlike step two of the 12 steps, this movement from doubt to faith. Step two of the 12 steps, Bill Wilson understood the power of belief, said that the second step is to come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. And I got to thinking, could Ephesians 3.20 be our step to confession of faith as a community of faith. By the power at work within us, God is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. You know, Bill Wilson took a leap of faith. He said, you know, for those of you who, who have trouble believing that there's a higher power, just act as if you believe it for a month and see what happens. It's changed lives. Just the movement from doubt to belief. And the first step is always the hardest. Just ask Peter when Jesus said, step out of the boat. Come on. First step's always the hardest. And here's my unabashed, uh, uh, prideful look at the first step of our first grandchild, Emery, about six months ago. The first step is always the hardest. But attitude impacts outcome. It is so important. It influences outcome. Surgeons know it. If their patient is dreading and depressed, that can interfere with their efforts to heal, just as in the body of Christ, our fears, worries, and doubts can interfere with, with the leader's efforts to bring healing. We must create a new and right spirit, which is where thriving beyond COVID comes in. And it is not only scripture-rooted, but research-based. Many of you know Carrie Newhoff. Um, from Canada, a prolific blogger. Um, he talks about how attitude, the attitude differences between growing and declining churches. And it's all about the number one difference, we can or can't. Growing churches believe they can, declining churches believe they can't, and they're both right. Growing churches make a way when there's no way, which Carrie says seems to be what God specializes in, if you read the Bible and understand resurrection, right? It's another book that confirms through research what I've been talking about and feeling. Matt Mayofsky, Jason Biasi, Eight Virtues of Rapidly Growing Churches. I wish they had called it Thriving Churches. It's not about numbers, but they interviewed United Methodists. They interviewed uh, a whole diverse group of inner city, rural, urban, and so forth churches that were thriving. And they found that the greatest game-changing decision leaders can make in those congregations that leaders made were to believe that the spirit was up to something in their congregation. Their quote is a good one. In small towns and big cities, wealthy churches and poor ones, in multi-site mega churches and in rural four-point charges, miracles are happening. Here's the difference. Some churches and leaders <clears throat> live, work, and act like they believe this, and others don't. And this distinction makes all the difference. And they write, talk to any of the pastors we interviewed, and you'll instantly see that before there was any evidence that a church would work, these pastors believed that God was up to something. God was going to do something significant 
and they were determined to be part of it. Now we're about ready to head into Holy Week <clears throat> from the vantage point of those early disciples standing at the foot of the cross must have seemed like another impossible situation. It's finished. It's finished. Our leader is gone. They didn't understand. They weren't clear. But they didn't understand the power of expectancy, the power of believing beyond what visually they were seeing. The resurrection changed everything, and the power of the resurrection, if we believe it and lead into it, is real. I've got a dear friend who grew up in the uh, Pentecostal Holiness Church, and every time she prays, and she's a prolific prayer, she says, I'm believing that. Do we believe that God is going to show up and do something exciting and impactful in new ways beyond COVID? And this really is Paul's resurrection witness, Ephesians 3.20. That's his witness. There is a power at work within us where God is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. Who would have imagined the resurrection? It may feel like Friday, but in Tony Campolo's famous words, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. <clears throat> so I would challenge you to expect God to surprise you. God surprised us in ways we could never have imagined. <clears throat> so this resource really is to, designed to help release the burdens of the journey, promote deeper faith, empower mission in three steps. Let go of what's holding you back. Fears, worries, doubts. We look into scripture that encourages us to let go and to have faith that God will lead us into a brighter future. By giving people an opportunity to share their fears, worries, and doubts, they're released from the power of those fears. And in this corporate setting, uh, it's, a, it's powerful to watch it happen. It really is. It's liberating is what people talk about. And then to trust God to empower your dreams and embrace your opportunities to talk about what are your hopes? What would you like to see? What is God calling you to do? Where is God showing up? To give people an opportunity to name them and begin dreaming about them. And the energy in the room at that point is palpable. And then finally, to rise up in resurrection spirit to face the obstacles and take your next step to give people an opportunity to talk about what they've learned about their mission in, uh, during COVID and the obstacles ahead. And finally, that's the resource, but part of the resource also is a, a self-study, a self-assessment that I created with the permission of Tom Rayner, who wrote Autopsy of a Deceased Church, uh, 14 congregations that they went and talked to the boards and the councils and the pastors after closing to determine what you, what uh, paths they were on that led to their demise. You look at this list, we could all find ourselves on this in various seasons. Slow erosion, past is our hero. You can look at all those lists. Ten years, pastoral ten years, no clear purpose, obsessing over facilities. Great commission becomes the great omission, being a preference-driven church. We're all on some paths. And repentance is about turning around and heading in the other direction. And all I did was create an assessment where you can ask your leaders, your congregation, are we on any of these paths? Not at all, slightly well down, crossing the infinite, it is finish line. Quickly, you'll, you'll see a, a pattern of maybe a next step. Maybe it's more prayer. Maybe it's a stronger focus on outward. Maybe it's discipleship. A next step, take a next step in faith. So I've run out of water. I've run out of gas. It's an opportunity for us to, to do a little Q&A. Maybe I didn't get my timer put on either. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my way out of this. But my, I'm totally open uh, to being contacted. Go grab it. Take a look at it. Ask me questions. Uh, and then I've got some questions that will be passed on to you uh, for conversation uh, in the breakaway time. So friends, that's as best I can do. It was a little about five minutes longer than I wanted to, but I hope it's been useful for you. Jeff, thank you for this plethora of information. I'm excited for our participants to take this into the breakout rooms and really ask Spirit to shine a light on what pieces of this 
are really connecting with the, each unique context that's represented here. And friends, as you go, I just really want to amplify what I hope you heard Jeff saying, that God expects us as humans to show up with fear, doubt, and worry. Every time God sent a, sent a messenger, that messenger started with fear not. So please do not be taking the extra burden of shame with you right. as you wrestle with this, right? Because the other thing that I will, will offer to this discussion is that fear, doubt, and worry can be transformed by connecting with Jesus. That, mm -hmm. my friends, is what the resurrection is all about. It's that exposure to that resurrection power that takes doubt and reshapes it into something else, right? Amen. And so let's, let's also add that. I mean, I was thinking about our gospel text from last Sunday and that encounter with Jesus and that transformation that happens. So I just will add that on as well as you head to the breakout rooms. Jason, I believe you have the questions for our participants. So friends, God bless your conversations. Can't wait to see you back a little bit before the hour. Thank you for um, the time that you spent in your small groups. So as is our habit, keeping the confidence of your small group buddies, I'm wondering what are some themes or some questions that have bubbled up for you? I, my group, I think I saw great hope. Yeah. Tell us more, I, Wendy. Oh no! I it just seems like those those sharing saw the hope, and you know God's church is going to prevail. Amen. We know how the story ends, right? Yes. We have the advantage of the Book of Revelation, so we've seen the ending. It's just a matter of what does the path look like as we walk there, right? Yeah, because we're living that in between, aren't we? We're in that yeah. in between time, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, Pastor Gwen, you're unmuted. Do you have something to add? Oh, basically. Um... Uh, by co our conversation, I mean, we both were just um, really excited and uh, just uh, fired up, to be perfectly honest. And so uh, we just appreciated uh, what Pastor Jeff shared with us because we know that God is able. And so um, we're just going to move forward with uh, what we heard and share Amen. it. Amen. I love it. I love it. We can see that, that energy on your face. Fantastic. Who else wants to share? Melissa, please. I appreciated the fact that um, Pastor Jeff names how, or said that the naming of the grief, the anxiety, the anxiousness, I think that's um, to give space for those. Because, yeah, when people are overwhelmed, to give space for that because you almost can't even move until you've named it and given it room to move through. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And, 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 and then honored that. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, so. And so many people, you know, you got a secret, you hide it in the, in the corner, in the, in the closet, and you don't talk about it. And then the secret has all the power. Right. And if your fear, worry, and doubt is not named, it's got the power. And Satan loves to forces of evil love to meddle with doubt, you know, and, and amplify them. So you yeah, name it, release it. So this conversation reminds me of this particular slide. It's one that I use in an overview of ELCA coaching ministry. And this really names for us friends exactly what this part of the conversation is talking about that as ELCA coaches, we look at the people that we walk with as naturally creative, resourceful, and whole. And I want to name out loud in this space that that's completely true, while at the same time, these same individuals can be bringing fear, doubt, and worry. Jason says this all the time, we are a both-and people. Jason O'Neill, were you the originator of that phrase? <laughs> <laughs> 
Martin Luther maybe Hardly. would have something. <laughs> Martin Luther would have something to say about that, I think. But it's true, friends. Those things can be intention. You've heard me as I've talked about my grief journey in losing my son. That one of my realizations is that I could feel deep grief and also great joy in that same space, right? That's the power of the resurrection, friends, and that transformation happening. What else would you like to bring up, friends? Bob, please. I'd like to ask Pastor Jeff if there was an action that through his research and dialogue and interviews and uh, interactions, if there was one action that you would pray for us to take, um, what would it be? Good question. One action I think um, is to look in the mirror and just that continuum, where are you on that continu continuum? Uh, where would you like to be? Uh, but make sure that if you haven't voiced the, that the darkest doubt, the greatest fear, the greatest anxiety, that you find an outlet um, personally. Um, and if your congregation hasn't had a conversation about what's this been like just emotionally and spiritually, that you figure out a way to do that, even structuring it somehow in worship to turn to your neighbor or whatever, so that the, the, the weekends that I lead, it starts with a smaller group and a bigger group and then ends with worship. And it's all about kind of uh, giving everybody the opportunity. So I, I feel like that's the, the, our greatest hindrance is the fear, worry, and doubt that we can't move beyond. And, and I, I want to make it clear, and Jill and Jason and I were talking, it's not shaming us for doubting. You know, Thomas did not get shamed at all. Just move beyond and and so that would be that would be the action step the session two you know trust god to empower your dreams is starting to lean in once you're free then you lean in on the power of the spirit but the first step if you don't get that together that's just going to hold you back in congregation councils living in fear we're in doubt you're not going to get anywhere you know with them pulling you back and pulling and standing in the way of the spirit so that's, so, that's the key piece. So a big part of that is bringing it out in the open, fear, worry, mm -hmm. and doubt, mm -hmm. and talking yeah. about it. Yeah, exposing it to the light of day, exposing it to God, exposing it to the light of Christ. You know, it's a great time. You're going through Holy Week and Resurrection. This is a great, a great movement time uh, mm -hmm. to move beyond the darkness, you know, of Good Friday. Thank you. And Bob, I too love that question. M Melissa, I'm sorry to cut you off. I just wanted to interject and say, friends, if you need uh, a partner to help facilitate that, please email Jason and I. We would love to connect you with an ELCA coach. And in particular, if, if you are needing to express that fear, doubt, and worry, one of our grief coaches would be specifically equipped to help make that happen, both for you as an individual and also in, in um, groups in your congregation. We yeah. were trained to do this. We are here to walk with you. Melissa, please. Oh, I was just gonna say we were praying with um, the text for this upcoming Sunday, and it's Lazarus. And Martha says, you can't roll that stone away. It's gonna be right, stinky. Right. <laughs> and right, right. Jesus says, pull it away and then come out. And then together they unbind Lazarus. He can't do it by himself. Yeah. So together we get to be unbound, and yeah, we all have that doubt. I don't know that it just was that just spoke to me. Like, yeah, we've yeah. got such rich um, texts coming up to explore with. Yep, and, and please feel free to to reach out. You want to have a conversation with me? I'm a I'm a level one coach, and I didn't say I was not. I didn't have a full time call. I've retired now, which to me is the ELCA's. Um, free agency system, actually. Uh, so I'm just going after my passion, the most passionate things. But I did walk uh, as a coach with three leaders through this whole thing and vicariously lived the craziness. 
So yeah, connect with somebody and get your leaders connected with each other. Give them permission. Amen. Pastor Jeff, thank you for the gift of your time, for the sharing of, of this beautiful resource that you have built and sharing your experience with us. We <sighs> deeply, deeply appreciate it. It's a beautiful example of, of indeed Romans 8 at work, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and so thank you for exemplifying that. Friends, hope that you um, come back next week. We have Bishop Mike Grillinghouse back. He's going to be giving us part two of his, of his story of, of embracing God's future, embracing God's future without forgetting the past, right? And so it's a beautiful follow-up to this conversation that mm -hmm. we started today. Mm -hmm. All right, friends. Amen. So, Amen. so thank you. Please know that you are seen, you are loved, and you are valued. Thank you for being with us. God bless you, thank friends. You. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.